the physics of particles. And let's start first with the problem in physics. Most objects that we can see are calculated with classical mechanics. They take that object and accelerate it to very high speeds, closer to the speed of light, and relativity needs to be considered. Or you blow up that object or any object, really, and they're made of atoms, which are made of particles that need to be described using yet another law of physics, quantum mechanics. The universe should not differentiate based on speed or size. Really, intuition tells us that it should really operate under one law, and there's a the problem. But why should we care about that problem? Well, because understanding the laws of the universe at the smallest of particles leads to a better understanding of energy and forces, forces such as gravity. And could we identify new forms of energy if we understood it better to power our growing population? Or could we sustain life much further from the sun? And the sun is the source of almost every known energy that we use. For example, fossil fuels can be derived eventually tracing it back all the way to the sun, obviously solar, wind, all of those based on the sun. Okay, so let's try to consolidate this and make some sense. And it's going to be shown that atoms and particles can be described with classical mechanics. And one of the methods here in this video describes waves, which will be shown to consolidate relativity. And this might be overkill, but five different methods are going to be sh uh, used to sh show particle and atom energies. And those particles are a hypothetical Planck particle, which generates the Planck energy, electron energy, and then hydrogen and helium. Beyond helium, there is a framework that's established and it can be uh, used uh, to calculate uh, lithium and beyond. But uh, here for this video, we're going to stay at a high level. So these two particles, those two atoms. And we're going to use sound waves as the classical example. Sound waves, right? Vibration of air molecules, which can be calculated calastically, with wave properties such as wavelength, wave speed, amplitude, density. But due to the conservation of energy rule, such as the speaker that generates those sound waves, that speaker operates like a spring mass system. So we're going to show that uh, these different types of equations can be used, spring mass system and waves. But the values are going to change. Even though we're going to use classical physics, uh, the values we'll be using are going to be much, much smaller. You know, for example, uh, replacing air molecules uh, pl with Planck-sized objects, which are orders of magnitude smaller. Our particle uh, will replace the speaker. Wavelength distances are going to be at the subatomic scale. But the point is, those are just values. Same equations, just the values are going to change. A couple of points. First on measuring energy, because it can be kind of confusing. Um, how do we know if there's energy in those sound waves? Right. One, maybe the most logical would be put something in front of it, like a ping pong ball in front of that speaker. Does it move? Right. There's energy. It's a force. A force of distance. Or maybe not as common, but it can occur in a process known as sonoluminescence. Um, suspendedly acoustic gas bubbles can uh, vibrate and uh, generate light. So there's energy. It's the frequency multiplied by the Planck constant or mass, which is energy uh, with consideration of the wave speed c squared. All right, but is there energy in the system? if the air molecules are not moving. This can be confusing, right? Because someone might say, well, yes, certainly they, there is mass and therefore there's energy of those air molecules. But let's do this. Let's say that there is energy if it can be measured and the sound waves are the measure of that energy. If there's no motion of those air molecules, then of course there's no motion of that ping pong ball, no energy. There's no motion of those gas bubbles that are vibrating. Therefore, there's no light, no energy. An ether or no ether, right? Medium. For sound waves to exist, there must be a medium. In this case, it's air molecules. Sound waves would not exist without it. But yet the physics are going to be shown that the calculations can be the same medium or no medium. And this is literally how particles are described without a medium for waves to travel. So let's do that as, as kind of method number one here. We're going to, here's a hydrogen sphere. And we're going to sum up all these Planck size objects. And let's assume that the sum of those all equal Planck mass such that the density is exactly the same. If you shrink all of that into 
Planck mass and a super small object with a radius of Planck length. Now, the energy of that particle, there it was the hypothetical particle, is Planck energy. So there's the first of the energies uh, mentioned earlier. And the remaining energies are going to be calculated as the Planck energy in a ratio of the Planck length and the radius at uh, which the uh, energy decreases. Now one point, special note about all the electron-based calculations uh, in this video. We're going to also apply the fine structure constant. An explanation and a lot of the work, the details are in the paper. You see the URL below. The link will also be placed in the description of this video. All right, but there you can see, using method number one, all of the energies uh, explained at the very beginning of this presentation. Electron energy, heart rate energy, helium energy. But how is energy transferred? Right, if sound wave measuring those objects, such as a ping pong ball or those gas bubbles, are replaced with particles, how does one explain motion for the creation of light? So let's replace that ping pong ball with something like an electron. There's empty space, so how does it move? That's the Coulomb force. Or how is that photon generated for light? So a potential solution is motion. But a very type of um, specific motion called uh, simple harmonic motion, which is also seen in spring mass systems. So let's assume that something physically moves and pushes it. There's a spring mass system. And these are classical equations. What's that potential energy for something displaced uh, x? It's based on the spring constant and its displacement. Now notice to the far right, um, you see the motion, a single, uh, simple harmonic motion um, generates a sine wave. That's displacement over time. And the max displacement there is a, which is amplitude. So if you assume something goes to that max amplitude and back to equilibrium, there's the energy. Right, half plus half equals Ka squared. Okay. Now, let's solve for these equations, but first we need to know what is that K and what is that A? Well, these are actually basic properties of the universe and they were discovered long ago. So amplitude is Planck charge. Now, see the note at the bottom there about units. And K, spring constant, is determined by force divided by distance, where the force in that numerator Coulomb discovered, and it's Coulomb's constant. This all makes sense in the next page. So let's solve for that energy equation uh, equals Ka squared from uh, the values that you saw on the previous page, and that's the energy equation that you get. And so you solve for the energy at uh, R equals Planck length, and once again you get the Planck energy, same value as method number one. And again, the energies for electron and hydrogen and helium use the fine structure constant. Sure enough, the same values, again, as method number one. Okay, but the explanation still doesn't make sense. Getting a little bit closer, but how can one particle, if it's in motion, affect all the other particles, especially if it's really far away? Not to mention that energy decreases that distance and the force it produces uh, decreases the square of distance. So how could that be? All right, so maybe a solution would be connected masses. Now we're just going to do this in one dimensional view. So how is that connected? It would be connected in series. Looks something like this where it affects the electrons. OK, and the equivalent, so calculating this classically, the equivalent constant uh, is related to each individual spring constant. Uh, in that form, uh, equation you see there. And if all springs are assumed to be the same value, which it will be in this case, then it can be summarized by the number of those in the inverse of each um, uh, spring constant. Number of masses in uh, hydrogen n, it's going to be its radius of hydrogen divided by the Planck length. So we're going to use Planck length um, as our spring constant, how we derive the spring constant here as well. So it's worth noting that you can probably solve for any number of these and change the spring constant. More on that in a second. But there's the value of the spring constant. I see there at the bottom that we're going to use on the next page when we solve for method number three. So in this case now we're solving for a series of connected masses uh, using the k value from the previous page. 
you have to determine the number of springs or masses for each one um, based on plank length. And once you solve through those, guess what? You get exactly the same values as the first two methods. All right, so three down, two more to go. All right, getting a little bit closer, but how can a particle be represented by springs, right? Because the universe is not made of springs, so why do the equations work? The potential solution now is a medium. And a medium just like sound waves, which we started off out, but instead of sound waves traveling at sound, we're going to have these waves travel much, much faster, which is the speed of light, c. They'd be traveling in a medium with a known density, and by the way, this is about the same thing as the Planck mass divided by the hydrogen sphere earlier, this is density, and the amplitude uh, remains the Planck charge. But now we're going to measure it in a volume. Uh, that's a longer explanation of the why this volume is a pyramid. Uh, you can see that, uh, go to the paper for those details. But using that volume, here's the energy equation, at least in 1D view. So we're going to use that equation for method number four. Solve for volume, space on that distance r. You solve that equation, again for all four. Sure enough, exact same values, but now using a wave equation. Are waves one-dimensional? No, but the equations work, especially for forces. You can draw a line between two particles or two particle groups to determine the force. But particles themselves are three-dimensional. So we're going to use three-dimensional spherical waves instead. And the same principle of 1D waves can be applied to 3D waves. We'll use the same density and the same amplitude, but now the volume is going to be spherical. Amplitude is expanding in three dimensions, and waves travel in defined wavelengths, and wavelength is added. Now that equation there can be used to derive equations for standing waves of energy, which are particles, and for photons as transverse waves. Um, but the derivation gets a little complex, and so I'm um, going to point you to the URL at the bottom if you want to see more information on the derivation. But just quickly, uh, since we're calculated electron before, there is the electron in standing three-dimensional waves, same energy. But because working now in, in this format can get a little bit complex, we're going to try to simplify it. So the simplification of 3D wave equations due to the conservation of energy, right, shown before, we did this for the 1D waves, they're exactly equal, spring mass energy, wave energy. Same thing's true for three-dimensional waves. Why? Because the speaker is forcing out those air molecules in the case of sound waves. The same thing happens here, it's conservation of energy. So in the 1D, that was the spring mass energy is wave energy, and so the same is going to be applied now to 3D waves. And using a very simple method where the elementary charge, uh, using it for amplitude instead of Planck charge, and a 3D spring constant instead of the 1D spring constant that we calculated earlier. You can see the values of both of those down below. So method number five now uses that equation. And sure enough, apply it to the electron-based one since we're using the elementary charge. So the Planck energy is not applicable in this case. And all three of those values, method number five, are equal to all four of the previous methods, meaning that all five are all equal. All right, but what about relativity? How do waves explain the behavior of particles in motion at relativistic speeds? That's what it looks like for uh, relativistic mass, increasing in mass, and you see the Lorentz factor there. Well, Doppler effect is the answer. Right? A change in wavelength frequency in relation to an observer moving relative to the wave source, which is another property seen in sound waves. And this has actually been done by many who derive the from the Doppler effect to get to the Lorentz factor, so I'm not going to reproduce it, but just one of the examples there is the URL below. But that's how you go from waves to Lorentz factor, which is seen in relativity. 
So let's just summarize. Five different methods were used to calculate energies of both particles and atoms without the need for quantum mechanics. Yay! And one of the methods described waves, which naturally supports relativistic equations as wavelength changes due to motion. So we get rid of that one. We collapse everything to classical mechanics and that the universe, if we were to conclude anything, hopefully operates under only one set of physical laws.